Okay, so the next presentation in the observation model uh, section is uh, by uh, Robin, and she's going to be talking um, about uh, close kin uh, mark recapture models as well. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, this is your second close kin talk for the day. Hans and I got together in Hobart last week and, and realized that there was some overlap between our talks, but we thought that it wouldn't hurt for you to all hear some of the fundamentals of close kin again, um, because a lot of it is, is very new to many of us. Um, my co-authors are Mark Bravington, who, as Hans told you, uh, is the, the driving force behind close kin these days. What Hans very modestly didn't tell you is that the whole idea was his in the first place, and that the Bravington et al. paper that, that he uh, told us about is Bravington Skaug and Anderson. Um, and my other co-author is Rich Hillary over there, who's done as many close kin applications as anybody. Um, my entry point into the world of close kin uh, has been through a beast called school shark, which Andre has worked on. The, the Australian fishery that Jemery Day told us all about yesterday, uh, which operates in southern Australia, includes a couple of shark species, um, one of which is very depleted. Andre put together the, the most sophisticated stock assessment model I've ever worked with, but it's in Fortran and proved definitively that it's time to stop fishing school sharks. So our industry got very good at not catching school sharks, even though they are associated with gummy shark, uh, which is now their main target species. Um, and the better they got at not fishing it, uh, the less informative their CPUE became with regard to school shark. We've had about 20 years now of, of really doing a good job of not catching school sharks. So you, Presumably they're recovering. Um, and what you can see here is, oops, it's, uh, where am I? It's, it's a species that's primarily caught by gill nets and secondary by long lines. It's not a target species for our trawl fishery. So the trawl CPUE is the closest thing that we have to, to an unbiased index of abundance. And that's what you're looking at there. Um, and that's showing that there does seem to have been an increase in abundance over time, which you would hope because we've set the catches low. Um, but there's a, there's a larger CV on that. And this series is impacted by whether or not the trawl fleet has been able to access ITQs. Um, so we need an index of abundance. And we got together, we had a workshop, asked ourselves what we could do. And it came down to, to two things that we felt we could do. One, we could spend a heap of money, develop a, a brand new uh, serve, at sea survey dedicated to school and gummy shark, would be pretty much all we got information on. Um, and every time we wanted to repeat that, this is going to be a very long recovery time. School shark is not a productive species. It's going to take a long time to get back to a point where we can fish it seriously. So we would have to have a number of these survey points and every one of them would cost just as much as the one before. The alternative was close kin. And the advantage there was that while the very first data point would be very expensive, every subsequent data point collects samples that you will be comparing with all of the samples that you collected first time round. So there's an economy of scale for close kin, which is, which is fairly unusual. So what is close kin? Um, this is where I'm going to repeat some of what uh, Hans has already told you. It's a mark recapture method, as you've seen, but instead of marking and recapturing the same individual, close relatives are marking their a shared parent, or you're getting a, a, an, a, an offspring of a parent, which is a mark for that parent. It gives you an absolute abundance time series the CV around that time series is at its narrowest um, in a year which corresponds with the average birth year of the offspring in your population. So the CV gets wider at either ends of that time series and you tend not to get very much information or, or any at all in the most recent years because it's an index 
not of the abundance of the population, but of the abundance of the uh, parents, the, the mature individuals in the population. So your, your time series abundance goes back to um, one, one uh, age, whatever the age of maturity is, you haven't got any information from that age to now. So that's sometimes a limitation of this method. Um, it gives you an estimate of natural mortality. The numbers of kin pairs that you collect are inversely proportional to the abundance of the mature population. When you're collecting half siblings, the time between the birth of the two siblings gives you an estimate of the survivorship of the population. So you're getting independent estimates of absolute abundance and survival. Uh, what does a close kin model need? Well, there are different ways of setting them up. So there are different answers to this question, but definitely what you do need is a bunch of tissue samples collected from your population. You need to genotype those and you need to do it well enough that you can identify half siblings. Parent offspring pairs are easy. Lots of genetic methods would, would tell you, how, would identify those for you, but half siblings are not so easy. So don't anybody go rushing out and, and trying to do a close kin project without first figuring out if you're using the right genetic technique. Um, you don't strictly have to have catches because you're, you're estimating survival and you're estimating abundance. And if you don't know what the catches are, you can't disentangle M from F, but you still get some idea of survival. But if you've got them, it's probably a good thing to put in. You don't need any other index of abundance. So if your CPUE is suspect, this is probably a method you'd want to think about. You don't need survey indices. The close kin is giving you an index of abundance, which is why we went to it for school sharks. There's a bat in this picture because um, we've done a range of marine species and now we've got our first terrestrial species that's about to have a close kin project done for it. Um, Fruit bat, no, fruit bat, flying foxes on Christmas Island. Um, this is a picture that, that you'll recognize from the one that, that Hans has shown us. Um, so I won't spend too much time on this, but I'm going to come at this from a slightly different point of view uh, from Hans. So what you've got on the left hand picture there. Ah. All right, so these are your parents. These are the offspring. Every offspring has got two lines going to each of its two parents. One of the assumptions of a close kin model is that every fish has two parents, which is uh, one of the, uh, an assumption that you can't argue with. Uh, whereas in a, a conventional mark recapture study, you're making assumptions about what your tag return rates are, what your tag loss rates are, um, um, and they're, they're a little bit harder to defend. Um, if you were to sample from that population, you sample the, the red and the blue individuals there and you take a look at the gen genetics and see how many are close kin pairs, you can see intuitively that the bigger the population is, the fewer kin pairs you would expect to find. Um, if you have one offspring in your hand, the probability that any parent, a mature animal, is its parent is going to be 2 over n. That animal has two parents in the pool. You've picked one animal. What is the chance it's the parent 2 over n? Um, the basic unit of sampling effort for close kin is the number of pairwise comparisons that you do. So on my right hand plot I've got four dotted lines, but actually I should have drawn a line from every one of those red fish to every one of the blue fish because every one of those is a sampling event and the outcome was either yes it was a kin pair or no it wasn't. So one of the one of the elements of magic about close kin is that if you've gone out so we collected 3,000 school sharks but our, our sample you, um, the number of samples that we took isn't 3,000 it's of the order of 3,000 squared because every comparison that we did goes into our likelihood. So the larger your population is, the better the economy of scale, because you, the, the, the sampling effort is proportional essentially to the, to the square root of the population size. 
Okay. Um, as Hans said, when he put this picture up, the practice is a little bit more complicated than this. Um, there's a, the, the one close kin paper I'm aware of that didn't come out of CSIRO is Rosanti et al. in um, MEE. Uh, it's probably the most accessible publication that there is. He's really boiled the, the problem down to a single cohort of parent offspring pairs. Right, so half siblings, similar cartoon. On the left hand side, we've got parents at the top this time, annoyingly, um, juveniles at the bottom, and we're only looking at mothers. The lines are, to, are linking a mother to her offspring. So some of them have got three lines, some of them have got two, one of them over there has got none. Um, that is a single cohort of juveniles. So the left hand side represents a year. All the mothers in the population that year, all the offspring that they had. The yellow offspring are the ones that I've sampled. I've looked at their, their genome, and although I haven't seen their mother, there's enough information in the genome that I would recognize her now if I saw her. So I know who she is. She is just one fish in the population. On the right hand side, we've now got a subsequent cohort the next year or several years later. Some of the mothers have died. There's a mother who's joined the population. Over there, she's joined the mature population. She was there before, but she wasn't mature. Now she is. Again, I sample a group of juveniles. Now the probability that one of the yellow juveniles on the right hand side is a half sibling of one of the ones on the left hand side. In other words, that they share that, that the mother of the one on the right is the same as the mother on the one on the left. Again, it's inversely proportional to the number of mothers, but now we've got to take account of survivorship. So we never see this mother, but she is a distinct individual now. She's not one of many. We've seen her offspring. We know who she is. Can we see her offspring again? Again, practice is a bit more complicated. Um, what you're looking at now is a representation of a series of cohorts. So we've taken a bunch of samples. They represent a number of cohorts, and we're going to be doing pairwise comparisons looking for, for uh, half-siblings and parent-offspring pairs between these cohorts. And as you already picked up from Hans's talk, to calculate the, the kin probabilities, what you need is a conventional age and sex structured uh, population dynamics model. So close kin is going to fit very nicely into an SS or a, a KPAM or any really conventional style of stock assessment model. Um, there might be some wrinkles though, which we'll uncover as we go along. Plus groups is one of them. Um, plus groups don't present a problem to any fisheries data that I'm aware of, but they do present a problem to close kin data because you don't know how old that animal was last year. Once an animal is in the plus group, it loses its history. So you either need to push the plus group out far enough, or we need to come up with some way of, of dealing better with, with plus groups, some fudge. Pardon? No fix it. You do it. Push it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a few things we want to fix. That's part of the message of my talk. Um, age and length. So now that we, we were talking yesterday about age and length structured models, it it's, gives you a massive overhead in terms of computation. Um, is it really necessary? Now, one of the, the problems that, that Mark worries about with, with close kin is that if animals grow systematically, if, if I am a lot short for my age. I've been short for my age all my life. So I'm probably less fecund all my life and you're less likely to see my offspring. Whereas Rich Hillary, perhaps <laughs> if he were a fish, we might be more likely to see his offspring. That's not random noise that can lead to systematic bias. How much does it matter? Well, we need to do some simulations to figure it out if it matters. And if it does, there might be some clever fudges we can put in place and still avoid having to do complete length and age structured models. Um, in a likelihood sense, um, close kin comes in as, a, as lots and lots of Bernoulli trials, one for every one of the uh, unique pairwise comparisons that you do. Strictly, that's not correct because they're not all independent. If you find an animal was the parent of another animal, then it's not also going to be its half sibling. 
that so long as your population is of a decent size, the, the assumption of independence is good enough. Um, I th as far as I'm aware, the only person who's actually put close kin into an existing uh, age and sex structured model is Rich, which he did with the uh, Southern Bluefin tuna. And he said it was easier to do than a lot of the other components of the likelihood that he had to calculate. So you can put it into a normal model and you can, you can keep your CPUE and your survey indices and your, your age and length composition data. It can all go in there or you can use a standalone close kin model which just considers the close kin data and maybe some catch data. Um, what does it look like if in code? The main point I'm wanting to make here is that there are lots of loops. Andre keeps talking about lots of loops. There sure are lots of loops. Um, for a parent offspring pair probability, so what we're doing here is we're setting up an array of probabilities, which we will use later on when we go and look at our actual pairwise comparisons. For every pairwise comparison, we want to know what is the probability that these two are a parent offspring pair. So we're gonna loop over the possible sex of the older individual, which is the one that we're hoping is the parent. Loop over the years, the sampling years, when you captured it and the ages, because that tells you the birth year. Um, and this is a pairwise comparison. So there's another animal here too. And we're gonna to loop over the years and the ages for that one. If we were doing a spatial model, we would also be looping over what zone they were caught in, and that's going to add two dimensions because it's the zone of the first one and the zone of the second one. Um, if you have to worry about lethal versus non-lethal sampling, which I did in, in one of my applications, then that's going to add another two dimensions. The dimensions can really blow up. Um, I think it was Andre who was telling us we do not want 20 dimensional arrays in our generic stock assessment model, so beware. You might get them here. Um, so here the, uh, I'm showing you a, a less simplified version of a parent offspring pair probability. It's not just two over n now, it's the fecundity of the parent given its age in the year that the offspring was born divided by the fecundity of the whole population in that year. So fecundity is important in the models. Yes, Rick? Oh yeah, yeah, they're small, they're small. And if they weren't small, then you'd have to worry about the independence of your Bernoulli trials. Oh yeah, yeah, but it's, it's one over that. So you get really small probabilities. Okay, so as I've, I've already alluded to some of this, there might be some complications. Um, you're probably not going to go out and age every one of the animals that you sampled. You will measure their length. So I've shown you the, the probabilities as a function of age, but you're probably going to have a subsequent step where you integrate and turn that into probability um, of actually having that age given the length when you were measured. If you've got aging, sufficient aging error to take account of that, you'll also be integrating over, well, what was its true age given what appeared to be its age? More loops. Um, and fecundity might be strongly length rather than age dependent and there might be systematic biases in that as I said before. Um, we applied close kin to grey nurse shark and I think I had some 11 dimensional arrays because some of them were lethally sampled and some were not. Some of them were measured dead on an autopsy table so we were pretty confident in those length measurements. Some of them were measured by divers going underwater saying, mm, I think that one's about one and a half meters, taking a tissue sample, swimming around one way around a rock while the shark swam the other way around a rock. And then they'd say, oh no, I think that one's two meters. And they take another tissue sample and we could see it was the same individual and it hadn't grown half a meter in two minutes. So we had to, we had to have different um, CV groups for, well, how good is the length? Um, another thing the divers were not very good at doing was sexing these grey nose sharks when they were looking at them underwater. And, and here's a bit more of the magic of a close kin study. We were able to correct all of those sexes. They got it right 60% of the time, um, but the DNA showed us what sex the individual actually was. Uh, stock structure. So we haven't done a lot of work in stock structure. So this is one of the, uh, you know, wait and see. 
issues. How much does stock structure affect a close kin model? We, we don't know yet. We haven't done a lot of that. It does seem to be somewhat forgiving. And as Rich said in answer to, to uh, Rick's question earlier, you do at least get information on stock structure from your close kin. So for School Shark, we, we were wondering whether they would, we knew that they moved a lot, but we didn't know if we were going to see stock structure. Well, we didn't. We got parents and offspring and, and half siblings from every place we sampled to every other place we sampled, which doesn't mean there isn't underlying biological stock structure. There probably is. And there might be, uh, there might be other dimensionality. So, so far, every, every um, study we've done has been different. And, and another question, well, I'll come back to that in a minute. We, we don't know how much that's a, a function of, of close kin. So I'll skip quickly over this. Half-sibling probability. Here you're looping over the birth years of both individuals, which you'll, again, probably express as the year you sampled it and the age it appeared to be or the length that it was when you sampled it. You loop over the unseen parent sex. Uh, and you, you never will know. Well, you do know what that is. Um, mitochondrial DNA tells you whether your siblings are sharing a, a mother or a father, although there might be some uncertainty in, in that, so you might be doing some integration. Um, as, as you saw from the cartoon, survival matters. The, the mother has to survive from the, the birth of the first individual to the birth of the second individual, and her fecundity might change. So this... Uh, this equation involves her fecundity in the first birth year and her fecundity in the second birth year. And again, there could be a lot of other dimensions involved in this. Um, the steps of a close kin project, you don't go straight into sampling and doing the genetics and the model, you, there's a design phase. And this design phase is a bit more um, arduous than it is for a conventional stock assessment. If somebody comes to you and says, I've got species X, here's the data I've got, can you do a stock assessment for me? You can probably make a fair guess at how much it's going to cost you to do that stock assessment. But when somebody comes and says, I want, can we do close kin for my species? How much is it going to cost me? Well, it depends on how many samples you have to take. And there's a desktop almost mini stock assessment that you have to do in order to work out how many samples you need to take. So, so that's, been, uh, that's been a bit of a stopping point. You've got to get money from somebody to get you time to, to answer the question of whether it's worth spending money on close kin for this species. Um, we've, we're writing more software and we're getting better at doing this faster, but there's a bit more work to be done there. Uh, and that's what I've just said. Um, but the the design stage uses the same probability calculations that I've just shown you that you will also be using in the, in the full exercise. So if there were a close kin module in a generic stock assessment model, what one thing you would want is you would want to be able to run it in close kin design mode, where you're not estimating the parameters of the model, but you're either taking a, a base case stock assessment that somebody's done before, or you're just making some fair guesses about what parameter values might be, and then asking, well, if I were to take 1,000 samples, 2,000, 3,000, what CV would I get on my abundance index? Um, we have probably done enough close kin work, not just completed studies, but we've done design studies as well that we could probably say what the typical teleost and the typical shark close kin module would look like now. But as I say, so those five pictures are the, the completed studies that have come out of Syro, and it's heavily weighted towards sharks for some reason. Um, but every one of those has been a little bit different. I, I, is there a tendency for a close kin project to be more likely to be bespoke than a normal stock assessment? I don't know yet. We need to do a few more to answer that question. They, they do address realities of, of reproduction, which we don't normally deal with. Um, and they do tend to throw up surprises. So in, in the school shark close kin model, there's some indication that females might be producing pups with the same fathers in subsequent litters, even though litters are, are th multiples of three years apart, maybe there's some sperm storage going on there. We know sharks do that. 
um, in one of our studies, there was uh, our basic stock structure assumption seemed to be somewhat violated by the data. You, you tend to, you get more information than you normally do out of close kin, and it's not always information that you want. Uh, then the, the gray nose shark had the lethal and the non-lethal sampling and the different ways of, of calculating length and that all added to, to bespokeness of that one. Um, but then there's also a tendency for the species that, that, that come to close kin to be the ones where nothing else has worked for. So perhaps they're the weird ones anyway. So in summary, um, expect lots of dimensions. Give us a bit of time, maybe we'll be able to reduce some of them, particularly the length one, um, maybe the, the plus group one. Um, let us think a little bit more about stock structure. We, we did a design study for southern bluefin tuna in the Mediterranean, where adults were being fished on discrete spawning aggregations, and there was thought to be at least one spawning aggregation that, that nobody had found yet. And Mark was able to work out that that, that was fine. So long as you sample the ones you knew about and you sampled enough juvenile foraging grounds, you could actually estimate how many uh, adults were spawning somewhere else. So there's, there's a, the nature of the conditional probability in close kin. You're not just saying I'm, I'm sampling randomly from the population. What's the probability that these two animals are kin? You're saying, well, I've got this animal here and its parent is X. Now what's the probability that that animal also has parent X? And that gets you out of a lot of, a lot of problems, a lot of sampling issues. So the spatial structure might not be too much of a problem. Paul Conn has done a simulation study for bearded seals and shown that dispersal away from breeding colonies doesn't need to be very high in, in order for close kin to work for that, which was good news. Um, so close kin is magic. It gives you absolute abundance and survivorship separately. Um, it doesn't have issues about tag loss and tag reporting as you do with conventional mark recapture. It's got a relatively forgiving sample design because of the conditional probabilities. Um, it, in theory, should fit very nicely into a traditional stock assessment model and Rich has shown that it does. Uh, it just comes in as an additional likelihood component, but there are still some issues that we are, are working on. Um, and we'd like a design mode, please. Um, the next piece of work that we're going to be doing, uh, Jemery talked about a multi-species MSE project that's underway for our fishery. Andre is involved with that. There are a couple of um, multi-species uh, harvest strategy proposals that are going to be tested, um, which might, as their basic stock assessment for at least some species, use close kin. So we're going to be writing what will be a somewhat, well, a generic standalone close kin model, which will fit into that system. Um, it will take data from the operating model. It'll calculate a numbers at age matrix with covariance. There'll be other estimates as well, which we may or may not use. And then we are hoping to put that into whatever stock assessment model is used in that MSE system as an additional likelihood component, which SS3 currently can't do. So I've been asking Rick for the source code so we can add that likelihood component so we can keep working on what is and isn't possible with close kin. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, we don't have that much time for questions, but I'm going to allow us a bit more time and we'll run into our lunchtime later on. So anyone has any questions? You didn't tell us how School Shark worked out in the end. <laughs> well, it's, it's in limbo at the moment because Patrick Cordew disagrees with everything we did, <laughs> particularly the conditional probabilities. He'd rather we threw that and all their advantages away and started again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. So I just wondered if you knew under what conditions your absolute abundance estimate turns into a relative one, um, or if it does. 
um, overall, for parent-offspring pairs, I don't think it does. Rich might disagree. For half-siblings, it can do. So one of the tests that we tend to do is to estimate a, a fudge parameter. If you get the fecundity wrong, you can get your half-siblings wrong. So we estimate a parameter which can scale the half-siblings to the parent-offspring pairs. And if that comes out of close to one, then you know that they're about right. Um, in the school shark model, we didn't know, we know nothing about male fecundity. So one thing we could do was assume that male fecundity follows female fecundity. We didn't have enough parent-offspring pairs to estimate the male fecundity at age relationship. Um, but we might have got that completely wrong. So we put in a fudge factor that allowed um, uh, half-siblings who shared a mother to influence the estimate of abundance. But the estimate that came out of the uh, half-siblings that shared a father was multiplied by this value that lay between zero and one, and it came out at 0.88. So we were happy that we got that close enough. Okay, yeah. Uh, Robin, over here to your left, um, right here. Thank you. Um, maybe I missed it, but um, what do the uh, the uncertainties around your estimates look like? It's a lot of probabilities multiplied by probabilities, and your final estimate. That that depends the on the number of kin pairs that you get. As as Hans said, we've been working to a rule of thumb during our design phase that we take enough samples to get fifty kin pairs because if you assume a Poisson distribution, that gives you about a 15% CV. Um, we've, we've shifted that to 100 now because that's provided, you get 15% CV provided you don't have lots of uncertainty coming from aging error and length error and so on and so forth. And, and of course, these things all do happen. So we're finding that, that about 100 kin pairs will, will get you somewhere close enough to 15%. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Um, what happens when there is, when some parents are producing many more successfully surviving juveniles than others? They probably are, uh, and that should just contribute to noise, unless there's a systematic bias going on, such as some individuals throughout their lifetimes are. Um, more uh, fecund than others. Um, we, we talked about the some litters are, are going to be more successful than others earlier, um, and that, that's a systematic bias, which as Rich said, we, we try to get around by just not comparing siblings that are born together in the same year. Yeah, Rick. Yeah, a question, a question on fecundity. Do you mean it as number of eggs produced or number of individuals at the earliest age that you might potentially sample them as a juvenile? I mean, at what life stage is fecundity it's, measured? It's contribution to the population. So the southern bluefin tuna example there was already a fecundity at age curve that I assume came rich came from counting number of eggs per female or something like that. Anyway, it, it turned a close kin showed that that these this larger individuals were even more um, disproportionately successful at producing offspring than than smaller individuals were than had previously been thought. It's it's true contribution to the offspring that you're seeing. That's a, that's a little bit vague. I don't think I can tell you exactly at what age that kicks in. It's, oh, Rich is going to tackle that one. I'll try. Uh, it's a relative thing. You know, as you can see up there, it's on the top, it's on the bottom. The scale doesn't matter. It depends. You can express it almost however way you want. For the SBT example, it's expressed as something that essentially starts from length, is integrated through to age, and is from zero to one. So, it, yeah, it, there's no scale issues with it in the sense the scale doesn't matter. I mean, we no, but the shape of the parameter it's does. The shape that Sorry, the shape of the distribution. So it's like relative reproductive output per capita. All other things being equal, that's how good you would be at being a pair. So is that relative curve input or estimated? 
uh, at this point it's now estimated, right? You need it all really to get it all. You need the pops and the half sips to disentangle abundance, uh, increasing success of being a parent and increasing or changing mortality. You need all both of those things. For school sharks, it was input. We had three parent offspring pairs. I think two, a female one was male. So we weren't able to estimate the fecundity, which is why we checked out our assumption about male fecundity, because that was a real thumb suck. For females, at least, somebody had been counting the, the number of pups that they were carrying. Okay, so that, that's actually related to a question I was going to ask. So you actually need both parent offspring peers as well as siblings to do yes, this? Yes, yes, you and, do. Well, here we didn't. So we got around it by assuming that we knew the biology well enough. But a lot of underlying biology had been done, but that is an assumption we've made. So, so if you don't have the parent offspring peers, but you know the fecundity, you can do all this analysis. Is that right? That's right, and we did. Okay, any other questions? Um, okay, uh, thanks a lot.